Usaran, where did you learn more about the culture? Was it during your time in prison or when you was with your family? When you came up to California, did anyone mention the Sons of Samoa to you? How was prison life? You know, like, how was it on a daily basis? And how was, like, the correctional officers? Were they, like, corrupt? I was wondering how you guys um, made currency and past weapons in there because I know that existed. Okay. Um, did your relationship with your families and friends change while you were in prison? What kind of support or resources did you find helpful um, during your transition back into the society? How has your experience in prison shaped your perspective on life? It's a good question. Um, <laughs> I could go on forever about that. That's a really good question. Uh, What's up, bro? It's good to see you. Oh, All this right. is my class, uh, my students coming in one by one. Good to see y'all. <laughs> they just uh, can't believe they're, they're meeting a superstar right now. <laughs> I appreciate it. Okay, I just wanted to say thank you very much, Uso Rana, for giving us this opportunity and for, for you for being uh, the guest speaker for this school over here in America Samoa for yeah, the second you time having. in a row. And I didn't know you were getting paid for this, but it shows me uh, that you care and you're doing it from the kindness of your heart. And uh, for the straight second time, thank you for giving your time and you know telling us what you've been through. Um, I let them watch some of your videos. They did like a, a case study, but they some of them didn't watch all of it to see what you, what, what you went through up in uh, California. But thank you very much for okay. giving this opportunity. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. The, the question I would have for you, just to start it off, is um, since we're doing an introduction of the corrections up in uh, America, can you tell us like a brief backstory how you became the the be in that situation where you were incarcerated? Like a short, detailed story, nothing too long, just short and sweet. Sure, sure. So first of all, I just want to thank everybody for coming and showing up and taking the time to hear me out, hear my story. Uh, I want to thank your teacher for inviting me. I know he cares a lot about his students and I'm grateful to be here to share my story with you guys. So for those of you that don't know me, some people call me Uso Ron. I earned that name while I was locked up in prison. But to, you know, kind of start in the beginning, when I was really young, unfortunately, I, uh, you know, kind of fell victim to the gangs in the streets and ended up going too deep into it and get myself into a lot of trouble. When I was a youngster, uh, one of the things that I did was I went out and I shot somebody and got myself locked up in the California Youth Authority. They charged me with attempted murder and eventually dropped it down to assault with a firearm, shooting out of an occupied vehicle. It was a drive-by shooting. I hurt the guy pretty bad. So they gave me nine years and sent me to CYA. In that facility, I did about three years and they released me, but I didn't really learn my lesson. I was still young when they let me go. I was about 17 years old when they let me out. And seven months later, I caught a murder case and they decided to throw the book at me this time which uh, made sense. So I had a prior uh, conviction, like I said, a shooting. So this case made it two strikes. In California, the three strikes law back then in the 90s, they were striking people out and sending them to prison for life. And so that was my second strike. I lost my trial and I received a life sentence, 15 years to life. But because it was my second strike, they doubled it to 30 to life. Hence the name of my YouTube channel, 30 to Life. I also had three other co-defendants that were with me on the night we caught this murder case. And they too received life sentences. I was the only one that received the 30 to Life sentence because of the prior. And my other three co-defendants received life sentences as well. The crazy part about the whole thing is that in this case, there was no weapons in this particular case. There was no firearms, no knives, nothing like that. It was all hands and feet. It was a fight. And so for them to charge us with second degree murder, it didn't fit the crime. Fortunately for us, we were able to file an appeal. What happened was they basically found that they violated my rights with jury instructions. So it took about five, six years while I was locked up in prison in one of the worst prisons in California. 
uh, where I saw a lot of bad things for about six years. <laughs> and uh, finally, our appeal came through. And so we were able to go back to the court. And while we were in court, they wanted to, of course, you know, convict us with the life sentence again. But eventually, after a year sitting in court, we were able to plead it down. And I was able to plead my life sentence down to a manslaughter, which it should have been in the first place. But it took six years to, for this to happen for the justice system to figure that out. And I got some time served, but ended up having to go back to prison and serve about five, six more years. So I served a total of uh, 10 and a half years because I ended up getting a little bit of good time at the end. So got lucky at the end. But yeah, that's pretty much my story with the system. As far as how we rock in the prison system, the Samoans, again, grew up here in California. So I'm, you know, what you call many call plastic. I don't speak Samoan. I don't really know much about my culture. My mom, uh, she wanted to raise us like maybe Balangi style. She always spoke English to us. So she didn't really teach us the Samoan way. And so when I went to prison, fortunately for me, there was a lot of Samoans there. And unfortunately, you know, <laughs> that there was a lot of Samoans there, if you know what I mean. But there was so many there, so many there. And so when I got there to prison, I didn't know what was going on, you know, and my first instinct was to go with the blacks, you know, go back to gang banging, go back to, you know, what I know. And I was fortunate enough to walk into R&R, &R, which was the reception of prison. And there was a couple of Samoans there who were working as clerks. And when they seen me, they were like, hey, hey, you Samoan? And I was like, yeah, like, you sure? <laughs> And, but they pulled me in and uh, they ran me down and found out that, you know, I really didn't know much and uh, just kind of basically put me to school. I ran with the Usos the whole time I was there. It was family oriented. We stuck together tough. It didn't matter what gang you were from on the streets, if you guys were fighting each other or whatnot. When we came in there, we stuck together because the, the numbers, you know, together we were stronger. You know, and it was it was pretty rough for a lot of us, the Pacific Islanders. We team up with the Asians as well. And, uh, you know, with with California prison system, you know, the Mexicans are pretty much the deepest and the blacks are pretty much the deepest. So they pretty much run the system. But we have made a name for ourselves. We've gained our respect on those yards by sticking with each other. Um, many wars have happened with our people and the other people in there. So. I really got a sense of brotherhood with the Usos, you know, really uh, blessed to get with our people in the system, even though we're in there and we shouldn't be in there. I was really blessed to run into our people in there. They showed me the way they taught me, you know, you know, about pride and, you know, sticking up for our culture in there and not backing down for nothing. So, you know, eventually I served my 12 years and got out of prison and uh, got on parole. I did about three years on parole and uh, here I am today. I suffer from PTSD. I saw a lot of violence in prison. So I have nightmares still and I still end up dreaming about being back in prison. Uh, this right here, the YouTube and everything and speaking with you guys is an outlet for me. It's a way for me to get things off my chest and deal with this PTSD. And I found that it also helps other people who get to hear my story as well. So that's pretty much the short version. If you guys ever get a chance to check out my YouTube channel, um, you'll get to hear more of my story, my childhood and so on. Uh, so I, I think I'll open up for some questions here or unless you guys got something else for me to touch on. Thank you very much, Usoran, for sharing that. I yeah. have uh, <clears throat> the floor open up to uh, Usoran. If you have any questions, uh, go ahead, ask. I got one right here. Uh, I'm right case, so, so uh, I have a question. <clears throat> how was prison life? You know, like how was it on a daily basis, and how was like the correctional officers? Were they like corrupt? Right, right. Okay, yeah. So for us, for the Usos, you know, just depends on where you're at. Uh, I was with the Usos in High Desert State Prison, and our program was mandatory. You had to come to the yard every day, you had to work out every day, and you had to post security every day. So the first thing we do when we come to the yard, we meet with each other, all the Usos meet with each other and we and we speak about any any issues that might be going in going on within the Cavale or any issues that are going on on the yard. 
anything like that, because first and foremost is security first for our people and what we're doing on the yard. So that's what we do first. And if we have to handle any internal business, like uh, say somebody needs to go, then that's what we're going to do today. You know, we're going to we're going to handle our business on the yard and, and make that work. And as far as the correctional officers, yes, they're very, very corrupt. They will set you up. They will get you more time. They will kill you in there. And uh, it's, a, it's a scary thing because they hold the power, you know, they hold the weapons, they hold the keys. And so, yeah, it's always an off and on thing with them. But we always let them know that we're not we're not afraid to go to war with them either. Uh, also, Ron, I got one more uh, right by here, right next to me. Uh, I'm it's uh, I have two questions for you, if you mind to answer. Uh, before you went to the prison system, how heavy was the war between uh, the Cribs and the Bloods before you joined the prison system? Okay, so when I when I went to CYA as a youngster, when I caught my first case, that was in the early '90s. It was like 94, 93. And uh, the war between the Crips and the Bloods was, it was pretty much on and cracking. So it was on site everywhere we went. So if you ran into your enemy, you had you had no choice but to get down. When you get into the prison system, it's a, it's a little different because of the fact that people be dying in there. So within the Uso car, there's no gang banging. And yeah, you know, you, you see the Usos, they still have it in them because they're from certain neighborhoods and things like that. But they get checked right away because, you know, we're not Crips or Bloods when we when we go in there as Usos, you know what I'm saying? So we didn't have that problem as far as war in the system. Uh, and one more question uh -huh. before I add on. Uh, were you part of the shakedown that happened in Los Angeles when California was trying to take away all the gangs in the streets when they send the special police force? to arrest any gang members that inspired the NWA movement where Ice Cube and Dr. Dre started making tracks about how police uh, brutality was too much for the street gangs to handle. So were you a part of that? Um, I, I wouldn't say I was a part of it directly, but you know, in, in those early nineties, um, that's when, yeah, gang banging was really just huge. And so, they were doing a lot of gang sweeps all through California at that time and locking a lot of people up. So yeah, back then they swept everybody in the streets, but uh, personally, no, I wasn't down there in that movement, no. Does, does anybody else have a question? Any uh, else in the, the classroom? Okay, okay, uh, Kitiara, okay, I'm gonna mute mine and go ahead and mute your uh, mic. Um, how has your experience in prison shaped your perspective on life? It's a good question. Um, I could go on forever about that. That's a really good question. Uh, it, it, it really shaped my perspective on life uh, in a negative way. I used to believe in the system. Um, you know, I grew up, like I said, I grew up back in the 80s, 90s. And, you know, back then our parents and everybody, they believe in the system. When I got locked up, I realized the way they did everything, the way they we're sneaking evidence in and, and all these things. They don't really care about you. They're able to do whatever they want. So the system is really corrupted. If they really want to lock you up, they're going to lock you up. If they really want to violate your rights, they're going to violate your rights. And which, which happened to me. And that's why I'm here today because the higher courts saw that my rights were violated during my trial. They don't care. They will, they will ruin your life like that. So uh, anybody else? I have a question. Um, did your relationship with your families and friends change while you were in prison? Did it change their looks at you because yeah. of your back the history? Yeah. So, great question. Um, yeah, I suffer from that today. I don't. I'm not really close to my family. Uh, ever since I was a little kid, since 12 years old, I was getting locked up. And even doing this YouTube thing, you know, I'm doing something positive today. I know I put my family through hell when I was a youngster. I, I give them that. Uh, but today I'm doing positive things. I'm helping people and things like that. I still don't hear from none of my family. I hear from total strangers telling me how good I'm doing. And that's pretty much what keeps me going. I don't hear from cousins, aunties, uncles, but they're friends with me on Facebook, you know, and uh, yeah, it's kind of a sad situation. I don't know if they just don't know what to say to me. I don't know what it is.
but yeah, it, it, it really messed us up. That was an excellent uh, answer. So you had to go through all that to where you, you, you got right now through all that pain, man, I give you a lot of respect Usuran, for going through that kind of trial in your life, man. Does anybody yeah. else have a question? Okay, yeah, go Mr. ahead. Austin, uh, I have a question. Go ahead, Lisa. Usuran, where did you learn more about the culture? Was was it during your time in prison or when you was with your family? Yeah, so when I went to prison, the Usos in there, uh, they, they basically put me to school. So, you know, they would give me paperwork and they would make me answer questions and pretty much try to learn as much as I can about our culture, uh, the way we get down in the islands and so on, you know, the Fa Samoa way. Um, they were teaching me that in there. And so, and they also tried to teach me Samoan as well, because a lot of times, you know, they didn't want people understanding what we were talking about and I wasn't able to communicate. So, you know, that was a problem in there. So. One of the things the Usos do in there is they try to teach you about your culture and they, they want you to speak the language in there so that we can, you know, stand out away from the other people in there. So, yeah. Thank you. My name is Barry and I also have a question. Uh, this pertains um, back to prison. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how you guys um, made currency and passed weapons in there because I know that existed. Yeah, I was wondering if you could shed light on that. Yeah, so for us, um, we're all pretty much known as the, the people that got everything. Not sure why it ended up like that, but our people are very resourceful. And so in there, we had it, I would say better than most of the groups in there. Um, if we wanted weapons, we could get it. If we wanted food from the streets, we could get it. And so it was, wasn't really hard for us to have these things. The Usos in there just had, they had resources and the low lows in there for some reason they liked us because like i said you know we always gave respect and so the low lows they were always willing to bring us in street food or tobacco or anything like that uh one of our money makers was gambling one of our money makers of course was you know selling tobacco and drugs but when i was in a certain prison in high desert uh the usos don't they don't mess with anything. They, they, they don't mess with drugs. They don't mess with the tobacco. They don't mess with the gambling. They don't mess with anything on that yard. So it just depends where you're at. Can I go next? Uh, go yes. Next? Yeah, yes. Go ahead. Uh, don't forget to mute your mic. <laughs> All right. Hey, Mr. Ron. Um, I'm such a huge fan of you. Thank you. Um, ever since Mr. Walter uh, introduced us to you, and I've, I've been on your YouTube like the whole time. Anyways, um, my question for you is, um, what kind of support or resources did you find helpful um, during your transition back into the society? Yeah. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, I didn't really have any help except for the fact of my wife and my daughter. They were the only ones in my life uh, the whole time I was locked up in prison. So I was able to come home to them, but coming home to them, of course, we were like total strangers, you know, it was a whole decade I was locked up in prison. So we had our struggles. Uh, I didn't have no resources or any, any outside help from anybody, uh, which, which really was unfortunate because um, I suffer from PTSD. So it took me a few years to understand what was going on with me. So if I had the help when I came home, if they would provide things like that, that would have been great. But no, yeah, I, I ended up starting this YouTube channel that you like, and it's really helped me basically get things off my chest and vent and uh, also find support from people like you guys and people who have been through the same struggles as me. They message all the time. They tell me their stories. They tell me about what they go through, how similar it is to mine. And so this helps me out a lot. Thank you. Um, This is not a question, but it's just, um, I'm really proud to see where you're at right now in life. You know, despite of all the struggles you came from I back in the jail and in the system, girl, girl. and thank yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Destiny, can you uh, mute your mic, please? All right, uh, it's me again. Uh, when you came up to California, was there any, like, did, did anyone that mentioned the Sons of Samoa to you when you came up to California and at a very young age? Because I watched a documentary series where a lot of the young Samoans, they were being, uh, they were doing a recognition where 
they would be jumped by five dudes and they had to fight them all. And, you know, hearing your story, when you came up to California, did you ever hear any rumors about, you know, being an SOS member or did you like, did they ask you if you want to join the SOS? Yeah. So in California, SOS is really big, um, especially in the San Jose area. Uh, and I'm not too far from San Jose. I got, I got family in San Jose. Uh, but like, again, I grew up in a different area. I grew up around, you know, blacks, whites, Mexicans. And so there wasn't really any Samoans out there. So I fit in with the blacks, but if I were to grow up in San Jose or in a community like San Francisco or any of those areas where Samoans were predominant, that's where the SOS was, you know, and that's where I probably would have ended up getting involved in that. When I went to CYA, there was a lot of SOS in there too, as well. SOS, and then there was the Tongans, the TCGs. Um, there, yeah, um, then of course you had the Compton Crips, the Samoans from Compton you know, Park Village. Uh, I never really had to experience that, no. Uh, I'm sorry, what's wrong? He's a talkative one. <laughs> it's all good, it's all good. Okay. Does anybody else have a question? Uh, Miss Majesty, uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Miss Majesty. Okay, I'm gonna read it. Given your knowledge of the law and the level of corruption in the just, uh, justice system, what action should we take to stop it in your opinion? Knowing that the law corrupted that is corrupted and there is no way we are going to fight against the government, which is sad and scary for our future. Mm, really good question. I think the the fight you're speaking of, I think it starts within the home. I think that, you know, with family, parents, I think that the children need to be educated on the system, you know, that we live under. Like what you guys are doing right now, going to class and learning about the law and such, you are the future. You can change these things, uh, make it fair within the system. So yeah, what you guys are doing today with the class and everything, learning about the corruptness and the system and everything, you are the future. So you can change this. You can go into the system. I always believe that people that understand this should be in the system so that they can change it from within, you know? Uh, fighting from the outside, it just ain't going to work. They have the power, they have the judges, they have everything behind them. So educating yourself, uh, learning the law, uh, getting involved, and changing it within. The, within That's what I think. And starting at home, of course, you know, the way we raise our children. Uh, so, Ron, uh, it, it's been one hell of a interview. I interview our uh, guest speaking. Thank you very much. I it, it reached past this time. Oh, Thank no you worries. for giving. I know you're a busy person, and it it's a uh, a pleasure to have you all the time. I and I'm, I hope I have you next semester in the fall. And then uh, I just wanted to say thank you very much. God bless. Hey, I just want to say this before you leave. Mm -hmm. I, I for my perspective, I'm 39 years old. Uh, OGs like you, the originals, you made us known out there. So we don't have to fight. So you guys put in the dirt and work to make sure they know who Samoans are. And when we leave with this island and go over there and they say, what are you, Samoan? Oh, they, they'll, give, uh, they'll, they'll give us that automatic respect because of you guys, the OGs from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So respect yeah. to you. So I wanted to say that to you last semester. But yeah, I just wanted to share that with you. So yeah. you are respected. And thank you for, for uh, making this channel uh, available for us to watch your life uh, ex uh, expire others and grow. And God bless you and your family. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. God bless you all. I really appreciate bye, you bye, inviting me. Oh, Ron, Ron, Ron. Yeah. Don't, 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 don't leave without saying it, bro. Don't leave it without saying it. All right. Hey, thank, <laughs> thank you all for uh, joining me here. I really appreciate it. It was an honor to speak with you guys. I'm so blessed to meet you all and I wish you all good luck in the future. And what you're doing here today is a good thing. Much love to all of you. And y'all know what it is. Stay the fuck out of trouble. All right. Love you guys. <laughs> love you. <laughs> love you. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs>